the use of precious stones in early times as amulets and talismans is shown in many ancient records and several scholars have assumed that the belief in the magic efficacy of stones gave rise to their use as objects of personal adornment it is of course very difficult either to prove or to disprove such a theory for even in the case of the oldest texts we must bear in mind that they do not in the least represent primitive conditions and that many thousands of years must have elapsed before a people could attain the grade of civilization necessary for the production of even the simplest literature for this reason certain investigators have preferred to seek for a solution of this problem in the customs and habits of the so-called uncivilized peoples of our own time but we must not forget that conditions which seem to us very rudimentary are nevertheless the result of a long process of development even if this development was arrested many centuries or millenniums ago it must have required a very considerable period of time to evolve such usages and conventions as are found even among the lowest races indeed many uncivilized peoples have very complicated rules and observances testifying to considerable thought and reflection fetishism in all its forms depends upon an imperfect conception of what constitutes life and conscious being so that will and thought are attributed to inanimate objects we can observe this in the case of animals and very young children who regard any moving object as endowed with life in the case of stones however it seems probable that those supposed to be the abode of spirits good or evil were selected because their natural form suggested that of some animal or of some portion of the human body on the other hand the wearing of what we call precious stones is more likely to have been due to the attraction exercised by bright colors upon the eye of the beholder and to the desire to display some distinguishing mark that would command attention and admiration for the wearer this tendency runs through the higher animal kingdom and its workings have served as a foundation for the theory of natural selection it seems likely that we have here the true explanation of the motive for the gathering preserving and wearing of precious stones since these objects are motionless they can scarcely have impressed the mind of primitive man with the idea that they were alive they were not imposing by their mass as were large stones and their crystalline form scarcely figured any known living shape hence their chief we may even say their only attraction was their color and brilliancy what effect these qualities had on the visual sense of primitive man may be safely inferred from the effect such objects produce upon infants the baby has no fear in regard to a small and brilliantly colored object which is shown to it but will eagerly put out its hand to seize hold and gaze upon a bright colored stone as the object is quite passive and easily handled there is nothing to suggest any lurking power to harm and therefore there is nothing to interfere with the pleasurable sensation aroused in the optic nerve by the play of color in this naive admiration of what is brilliant and colored the infant undoubtedly represents for us the mental attitude of primitive man probably the first objects chosen for personal adornment were those easily strung or bound together for instance certain perforated shells and brilliant seeds the softer stones wherein holes could be easily bored by the help of the simplest tools probably came next while the harder gems must have been hoarded as pretty toys long before they could be adjusted for use as ornaments unquestionably when these objects had once been worn there was a disposition to attribute certain happenings to their influence and power and in this way there arose a belief in their efficacy and finally the conviction that they were the abodes of powerful spirits in this as in many other things man's first and instinctive appreciation was the truest and it has required centuries of enlightenment to bring us back to this love of precious stones for their aesthetic beauty alone indeed even today 
we can see the power of superstitious belief in the case of the opal, which some timid people still fear to wear, although until three or four centuries ago this stone was thought to combine all the virtues of the various colored gems, the hues of which are united in its sparkling light. A proof that bright and colored objects were attractive in themselves, and were first gathered up and preserved by primitive man for this reason alone, may be found in the fact that certain birds, notable, the Clamadera of Australia, related to our ravens, after constructing for themselves pretty arbors, strew the floors with variegated pebbles, so arranged as to suggest a mosaic pavement. At the entrance of the arbors are heaped up pieces of bone, shells, feathers, and stones, which have often been brought from a considerable distance, this giving evidence that the birds have not selected these objects at random. It is strange that the attraction exercised upon the sense of sight by anything brilliant and colored, which is at the same time easily portable and can be handled or worn, should be overlooked by those who are disposed to assert that all ornaments of this kind were originally selected and preserved solely or principally because of their supposed talismanic qualities. The theory that colored and brilliant stones were first collected by men because of their beauty rather than because of their talismanic virtues is corroborated by the statement made that seals select with considerable care the stones they swallow, and observers on the fishing grounds have noted this and believe that pebbles of chalcedony and serpentine found there have been brought by the seals. The popular derivation of the word amulet from an Arabic word hamalat, signifying something suspended or worn, is not accepted by the best Arabic scholars, and it seems probable that the name is of Latin origin, in spite of the fact that no very satisfactory etymology can be given. Pliny's use of amuletum shows that with him the word did not always denote an object that was worn on the person, although this latter became its meaning. The old etymology given by Varro, 118-29 B.C., who derived amuletum from the verb amuliri, to remove, to drive away, may not be quite in accord with modern philology, but still has something to recommend it, as far as the sense goes, for the amulet was certainly believed to hold dangers aloof, or even to remove them. Talisman, however, a word not used in classical times, undoubtedly comes from the Arabic tilsum, this being in turn derived from telsoma, used in late Greek to signify an initiation or an incantation. It has been remarked that in the earliest Stone Age, there is no trace of either idols or images, the art of this period being entirely profane. In the later Stone Age, however, entirely different ideas seem to have gained the ascendancy, for a majority of the objects of plastic art so far discovered have a religious significance. This has evidently proceeded from the conception that every image of a living object absorbs something of the essence of the object itself, and this conception, while a primitive one, still presupposes a certain degree of development. This rule applies more especially to amulets, which were therefore fashioned as beautifully as primitive art permitted, that they might become fitting abodes for the benevolent spirits believed to animate them and render them efficacious. A curious idol or talisman from Huailu, New Caledonia, is in the collection of Signor Giglioli. This is a stone bearing naturally a rude resemblance to the human form. We can easily understand that such an object was looked upon as the abode of some spirit, for similar strange natural formations have been regarded with a species of superstitious awe by peoples much more civilized than the natives of New Caledonia. For the Middle Ages, and even down to the 17th century, the talismanic virtues of precious stones were believed in by high and low, by princes and peasants, by the learned as well as by the ignorant. Here and there, however, a note of skepticism was sometimes apparent, 
as in the famous reply of the court jester of emperor charles v to the question what is the property of the turquoise why replied he if you should happen to fall from a high tower whilst you were wearing a turquoise on your finger the turquoise would remain unbroken the doctrine of sympathy and antipathy found expression in the belief that the very substance of certain stones was liable to modification by the condition of health or even by the thoughts of the wearer in case of sickness or approaching death the lustre of the stones was dimmed or else their bright colours were darkened and unfaithfulness or perjury produced similar phenomena concerning the turquoise the prosaic explanation can be offered that this stone is affected to a certain extent by the secretions of the skin but popular superstition saw the same phenomena in the ruby the diamond and other stones not possessing the sensitiveness of the turquoise hence the true explanation is to be found in the prevailing idea that an occult sympathy existed between stone and wearer the sentiment underlying the conception is well expressed by emerson in the following lines from the amulet give me an amulet that keeps intelligence with you red when you love and rosier red and when you love not pale and blue a persian legend of the origin of diamonds and precious stones shows that in the east these beautiful objects were looked upon as the source of much sin and sorrow we are told that when god created the world he made no useless things such as gold silver precious stones and diamonds but satan who is always eager to bring evil among men kept a close watch to spy out the appetites and passions of the human mind to his great satisfaction he noted that eve passionately loved the many-coloured flowers that decked the garden of eden he therefore undertook to imitate their brightness and colour out of earth and in this way were produced coloured precious stones and diamonds these in after time so strongly appealed to the greed and covetousness of mankind that they have been the cause of much crime and wretchedness the present age could afford us nearly as many examples of faith in talismans and amulets as any epoch in the past if people were willing to confess their real beliefs however they are half ashamed of their fondness for such objects and fail to see that back of all the folly and superstition that may find expression in this way there is a deeper meaning in these talismans than we at first perceive we may be disposed to smile when we are told that many of the soldiers in the austro-prussian war of eighteen sixty six carried amulets of some kind upon their persons and that the great marshal conrobert trusted to the protection of an amulet in the crimean campaign of course the russian army during the russo-japanese war was amply provided with amulets religious medals or pictures to which a special virtue had been given by a priestly blessing in all these cases however it is not the object itself but the idea for which it stands and which it incorporates that gives confidence to the wearer and in this sense the wearing of a talisman is no more a proof of blind superstition than is the devotion to a flag in itself only a few square feet of silk or bunting but nevertheless the symbol of the noblest ideas and feelings of patriotic devotion to one's native land and to one's fellow countrymen the tendency to give a substantial visible form to an abstract idea is so deeply rooted in humanity that it must be looked upon as responding to a human necessity it is only very rarely that purely intellectual conceptions can satisfy us they must be given some external palpable and visible form to exert their greater influences although it may bear a certain superficial likeness to fetishism this use of signs and symbols is something entirely and radically different for the idea is never lost sight of it is only strengthened and vivified by the contemplation of the symbol hence while we know quite well that the symbol is nothing in itself 
we know just as well that it has a real power in its relation to the idea it typifies, and we can no more be indifferent to its injury or destruction than we could be indifferent to the injury or destruction of a cherished memento of one whom we have loved and lost. What super-subtle sense is it that enables some women to endow their gems with a certain individuality, and leads them to feel that these cold, inanimate objects partake of human emotion? A French writer, Madame Catul Mendez, gives expression to this when she says that she always wears as many of her rings as possible, because her gems feel slighted when she leaves them unworn. She continues, I have a ruby which grows dull, two turquoises which become pale as death, aquamarines which look like sirens' eyes filled with tears when I forget them too long. How sad I should feel if precious stones did not love to rest upon me.' 